Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This episode is brought to you by Wren, W-R-E-N. Wren is a startup company working toward finding solutions to the climate crisis. Yes, you heard me right. You know my position on this. I think global warming is real and human-caused. I think we have time to do something about it. I'm not a catastrophist. I don't think it's the end of the world. But I think it is something we have to pay attention to. You might have noticed the summer has been the hottest on record, not only in the U.S., but also in the U.K. and in much of Europe, going through a massive heat wave. Just incredible. These guys at Wren.co, if you go to Wren.co slash Shermer, and sign up, we'll plant 10 trees in your name if you do it through this show. How cool is that, right? This is, their, this is their mission, to plant trees based on your carbon footprint. So when you subscribe, you get to get your carbon footprint. I did mine. You want to know what it is? Oh, boy. <laughs> it's not as bad as it could be. It's worse than uh, the average of the world at 49 tons of CO2 a year, India 2.4, the UK 6.7, the US is 18.3 on average, minus 16 tons of CO2. Yay, I beat the average for the United States. I'm not sure why that is, because I use a lot of electricity, and I don't know, I eat, I'm not a vegan or vegetarian. I'm not sure what it is, uh, but uh, I'm lower on goods and services. I'm lower on transport, because I, I drive that Tesla. Although I know the electricity is not really free, it comes from a power plant somewhere that sends it to that plug in the side of my wall. My diet's good, two tons a year versus three on the average. My energy is good, 1.9 tons a year versus 3.6 for the average in the United States, maybe because I live in California, so climate's a little more mild, who knows. Um, my home and pets, not so good. I use a lot of electricity, air conditioning, I guess, and I got a big dog. It probably doesn't help, but I'm keeping him. So instead of that, to get rid of my dog and my car and my food, I'm going to plant trees through this great company. Check it out, wrenren.co slash Shermer. They will plant trees in your name, which is super cool. And when you subscribe, you're doing your share because they will continue to plant trees and you get your carbon footprint checked out. And I th just think this is the greatest thing. <laughs> I love finding solutions to specific problems like this that don't diminish anybody and don't take anything away from anybody. It's just adding and to our progress. So check it out, wrenren.co slash Shermer. And I uh, appreciate your support. Before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium is a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by The Teaching Company. You know, the former great courses, you've heard me talk about them for many years now. They bring you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, my favorites, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, my other favorite, and more. Check it out if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, that is W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get a free trial, two weeks. Why would you not take it up? Free. And, uh, and then 20% off your annual subscription rate. When you get the subscription, you get access to all their content. Just endless, endless, hundreds and hundreds of, of these um, courses and whatnot. I just found a new one. I thought I had heard this course already. This is a different one. This kind of big history. I've tried, I've been listening to all the big history courses they offer. This one's called The Big History of Civilizations, Using Cutting Edge Historical Approach to Trace the Story of Human Civilizations from Our Emergence as a Species 36. 30-minute lectures. Oh, boy, that'll keep me busy for at least a week, <laughs> maybe more. A tale of two ancient cities, the rise of humanity, foraging in the old Stone Age. I guess that's the Paleolithic, right? Origins of agriculture, our cities and states. It's all about power. you got to capture energy or else you can't have cities and states. The era of the agrarian civilizations, innovations of Mesopotamia, the downfall of Sumer, Society and the Culture of Egypt. I'm going to skip down here. Uh, Greek gods, philosophy and science, Islamic expansion and rule, culture and empire in South America. I'm just you know blasting down here. The Industrial Revolution, transformative 20th and 21st centuries. Here we are, 21st century civilization, the biosphere and tomorrow. And the last lecture, number 36, civilizations of the distant future. Love that subject. Wrote about that in my um, 
last chapter of the moral arc. Really cool stuff. Check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. Get your free trial and your of two weeks and your 20% discount. Why would you not try this? And it also supports the podcast. If you appreciate our work here, go to them, wondrium.com slash Shermer, and uh, that really makes a big difference. All right. Thanks for listening. Here's our episode. My guest today is Stephen Bloom, who is a professor of journalism at the University of Iowa. He is the author of Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes, Here It Is, A Cautionary Tale of Race and Brutality, published by the University of California Press. He's also the author of The Audacity of Inez Burns, Dreams, Desire, Treachery, and Ruin in the City of Gold, Tears of Mermaids, The Secret History of Pearls, The Oxford Project, Inside the Writer's Mind, and Postville, A Clash of Cultures in Heartland America. He has worked for the Los Angeles Times, the Dallas Morning News, San Jose Mercury News, Sacramento Bee, Latin America Daily Post, and Field News Service. We will provide links to his various writings in the show notes below. And uh, I'm most interested in talking to him about the book, which I read. And in fact, I love this book so much, we're excerpting it in the next issue of Skeptic on race, for obvious reasons. If you don't know this story, it's an incredible story. Uh, about a teacher who tried to teach her students about racism uh, long, long before our current racial uh, divides in America. So let's let's let this conversation eventually get around to talking about the current events. But uh, Stephen, give us a little bit of background of who you are and and how you came to uh, write this book. What interested you in it, and and a little details about you that we can't read in the uh, on the back jacket flap of your bio. Thanks, Michael, for having me. Um, I, I'm an old newspaper reporter. I um, I worked for 25 years for daily newspapers, and uh, in the early 90s, I decided that newspapers were changing, and I wanted to teach about uh, how to write effectively and carefully and and with empathy. And uh, so I started teaching at the University of Iowa, uh, where I've been for almost 30 years now. Um, in in Right after my first book came out, Postville, uh, I got a phone call from a woman uh, in northeastern Iowa, a woman uh, named Jane Elliott. Um, Ms. Elliott was a retired teacher at that time and never really heard about Jane, but I knew about her experiment. Uh, Jane, in 1968, the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, was teaching a third grade uh, class of students in a tiny town called Riceville, Iowa. And Jane decided that uh, these were all white kids and they had to know what it was like to grow up black in America, particularly in the wake of the King assassination. She divided the class of of 18 kids into blue-eyed kids and brown-eyed kids. Um, She intentionally was cruel to the blue-eyed children. She said to the blue-eyed kids, you can't have second helpings. in the cafeteria at lunch. Uh, you can't play on the jungle gym because uh, you you kids, you ruin those kinds of things. Uh, don't even do your homework, blue-eyed kids, because uh, you're too dumb. Uh, and even if you were to do your homework, you'd probably get it wrong because that's just the way you children are. So essentially what, what Ms. Elliott was trying to do was simulate racism uh, with white kids based not on color of the skin, but color of their eyes. Um, That happened on a Friday, and uh, she didn't tell anyone, including the parents, that it was an experiment. On Monday, she reversed uh, colors, and suddenly the brown-eyed children were the so-called underlings. They were the, um, uh, the less attractive students. They were the ones who were simulating what it was like to be black in America. Uh, all this was an effort to to try to import racism to yes, it's uh, astonishing. Eight, uh, I knew nothing children. about uh, the details of this until I read your book. You know, I taught psych intro, you know, one on one for years, fifteen years, and uh, you know, it's in every textbook, and you read about it, and I got it from Phil Zimbardo, and because it's kind of in that vein of guerrilla theater type uh, psych experiments in the sixties and seventies. Uh, at which you just kind of do these demos. I mean, Phil has been criticized that the Stanford prison experiment wasn't an experiment at all. It was 
you know, where's the control group? <laughs> and in that sense, Jane Elliott's experiment is is really more kind of a, a demonstration, although everybody refers to it as experiment, including me. So, um, you know, we can we can talk about that a little bit. But, you know, this was probably before there were um, institutional research boards that, um, you know, ethical boards that approve those sorts of things that probably would never be approved today. Um, but but really, Arthur, there, there are some ethical issues there where. She's lying to children. She's making them hate each other. She's dividing them up, and she's making up stories about melanin and the color of the eyes, and that that makes some less intelligent, and so on. Talk a little bit about the ethics of it, even at that time. You know, the, the, these were third graders. The, these were kids in a in an insular rural town in uh, the the northeast corner of Iowa. It's for the geographically challenged. It's right near the uh, the state line of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, this is a small community of 700 people. Jane Ellie grew up in this community. Uh, she returned there to be a teacher. Um, Jane didn't want to ask the parents for permission because uh, well, for a couple of reasons. One, she of course was concerned they wouldn't give permission. But two, you know, this is 1968. This was a, a time when, in in a small farming town, the the teachers really knew what they were doing. She, uh, you didn't question a teacher. She didn't uh, share with the principal what she was about to do either, um, and she didn't share with the parents at all. So um, Jane's thinking, I believe, was that. Uh, this had to be spontaneous. This had to happen. Um, and and by preparing the students, of course, that would take away the punchline. So, yeah, there are ethical issues. And, and but part of the book that I wrote, Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes, includes interviews with students 40, 50 years later and, and the impact of, of this experiment. I, I need to say, Michael, that Jane Elliott didn't do this experiment just once. She did it for about... 12 straight years. And surprisingly, students who had been through the experiment didn't reveal the punchline of the experiment to their younger brothers and sisters. It was just somewhat of a rite of passage that, that students in this community went through. Um, Jane happened to do this at, a, at an opportune time in American history because this is 1968, uh, in starting in the, in the early 1970s, corporations, um, uh, government organizations, all decided that gee, we need to do something to to impart a sense of of equality, uh, to impart a sense of 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 um, of training to to deal with people who are different from us. And so Jane went on the lecture circuit after quitting her job at uh, the Riceville Public Schools. And Jane uh, went to colleges and universities. Jane went to uh, Fortune 500 corporations and did very intense uh, what would be called sensitivity training sessions, team building sessions. Um, uh, also that, that we could understand what it would be like to be different from us. Um, different didn't necessarily mean a uh, different color. It could mean different religion. It could mean different gender. It could mean uh, rural versus urban. Um, and Jane really, in a sense, turned into a, a, a shock jock. She, she uh, would put people uh, on the spot, bring them up in front, of an audience of, of 500 people and, and intentionally berate them, all with the guise of saying, we have to know what it's like to be different from us. We have to share some of that racism, some of that sexism, some of that, that discrimination that others feel yeah, you open the book in order to do our job she better. She called you uh, and asked you essentially to write a, biography of her she must have known your reputation as a as a uh, book author and newspaper man and, and a good writer 
Um, and so, but, but it ends uh, with with an interesting twist toward the end there. I always had this impression, Jane Elliott, she must be one of these, you know, really sweet tempered, almost a, like a Andy Griffith show, Mayberry, uh, you know, grammar school teacher uh, who uh, just kind of stumbled into this thing accidentally, but that's not at all the way she was. So give us a little bit of background on her. Where'd she get this idea? What was she like kind of temperamentally and, and how was she received by her fellow teachers at the school? Gee, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the nut of the whole book and, and it's an important question. Um, okay, so, so for your listeners, Riceville is a tiny, tiny town. It's an insular town. People who grew up in Riceville don't even get to the county seat, which is 18 miles away, which is Osage, Iowa. Um, you know, an awfully big trip would be to go to the state fair in Des Moines, about 140 miles away. Um, it's a town of almost 100% farmers. Um, <laughs> Jane grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. There were tracks in Riceville. Um, th th those tracks have no trains on them these days. Um, Grain went to Chicago and Grain went to Des Moines and, 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 and Grain went to the big marketplaces from um, small towns like, like Riceville. Um, but, but Jane was from a from a family of, of a Catholic and a, uh, a, a Protestant. And that just wasn't done in a tiny town like Riceville. Um, Jane had a, a slew of brothers and sisters. Her father was uh, somewhat of a character. Uh, Jane went to a one-room country school. Uh, and it wasn't until high school that Jane came into town and, and went to Riceville High. Um, uh, Jane was picked on. Jane was a country bumpkin. Um, and uh, Jane went to uh, Iowa State Teachers College, which is now uh, University of Northern Iowa, uh, spent two years and got a certificate to teach. And, and after a couple of years, got married and returned back to Riceville. Jane's a tough cookie, we'd say today. Uh, Jane is, is small, but she packs a wallop. Um, she tells it like it is. Um, and Jane, I believe, and in talking to probably 200 of the 600 people in Riceville and probably another 100 of her former students, um, Jane wanted to make an impact. Jane had never met a Black person before she went to to Iowa State Teachers College. Um, Riceville had never uh, been a destination for anyone who was really any different from those who had previously been in Riceville, who had grown up there. Um, so, so Jane had a chip on her shoulder, I guess is what we'd say. And, and Jane tried to shock people. Uh, and... and uh, when 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 King was killed, um, Jane declared to everyone that it was about time that that my white students understand what it would be like to grow up black in America. Uh, and and she said she came up with this experiment on her own. It was one of those aha moments that that some that some of us have. In fact, the experiment had been tried before and before and before. The experiment it was nothing new, um, but Jane turned up the volume. Jane turned up the dial as, as Phillips and Bardo did. And uh, to, to, to try this out on, on young children, um, to demean, to vilify, to demonize young children, to say that eye color determined intelligence, um, it had a lasting impact. I talked to kids who now aren't kids, who are adults in their uh, late 50s, who remember that experiment uh, as it happened, like it happened yesterday. Um, unfortunately, the experiment didn't stop in Riceville. This is the key. This is what's really important about the book. 
um, the experiment took on a life of its own. As I mentioned earlier, Jane went on a, a national circuit. Jane spoke to colleges and, and to universities. Um, it was an easy way for America to deal with obliterating racism. There's no way to obliterate racism. It's part of, of who we are as people growing up in a, in a society that is multicultural. Um, but the media understood very quickly, gosh, if we can ameliorate, if we can erase racism by the simple one, two, three-day experiment, wow. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I'm a media person. I worked for newspapers for a long time. I teach uh, journalism kids. Um, I, I was sort of part of this problem because in after Jane called me in, in about 2000, um, I was sort of intrigued by this experiment. And um, Jane wanted me to write a book about her um, because of a previous book I had done about rural Iowa. And, and so I was a, a little seduced by this, um, by, by just how quick and how seamless this simplistic experiment was. And I drove up to Riceville and I, I interviewed Jane and, and uh, I ended up writing a story for the Smithsonian Magazine, a, a, a well-known magazine that's connected to the Smithsonian Institution. And, um, and I, I must say that um, after talking to a whole bunch of people in Riceville, uh, I got about 30% of people who said, Jane's a tough cookie, but it worked. It made me understand what black people go through. Uh, about 70% of the people said, Jane's a huckster. She's a con woman. She's a grifter. Um, and she's in it to make money and she's in it to make a name for herself. Um, you know, in, in the confines of American journalism in, in the early uh, 2000s, I wrote a story pretty long, about 4,000 words, which uh, hewed to the objective notion of journalism. You know, he said, she said. Uh, but, uh, and that appeared in Smithsonian and that got a lot of miles for Jane. And so I, I was part of her publicity machine, I must say. Um, but, you know, every journalist has a story that, that sticks in their, their gut. And um, I, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the theory that you could uh, change people's attitudes um, you know, in a day or two, uh, just by being cruel to them. It was punitive. You know, uh, it, it was, we're going to punish people because of their eye color, i.e. we're going to punish people because they're white, or we're going to punish people because they're Hispanic. Uh, we, we're going to do everything we can to, to put you in the shoes of, of someone else, uh, of a gay person you know, uh, of, of a trans person, ultimately, of a black person, didn't make any difference. And we're just going to be as cruel as hell to you. So you're never going to forget that. But I got to say, that has lasting impact. Uh, and, and, and so Jane, as I said, went on the lecture circuit. And, and suddenly, the media just gravitated to her. Um, like, like, I must say, like flies to flypaper. And, and people started paying Jane an awful lot of money. She traveled all over the, the United States, indeed all over the world, to Australia, to, uh, to Europe, to uh, the Middle East. Uh, she spoke at huge corporations, making lots of money and making lots of enemies. And um, it, it stuck in my craw that that was wrong. So about 18 years after I got that initial call from Jane, I, I made another trip up to, to Rice when I said, okay, I'm going to take you up on this and I'm going to, I'm going to try to write a book, but um, you're not going to have vetting power over the book. I, I'm going to try to do this book fair and square. I'm going to talk to as many people as I possibly can. That's what a journalist tries to do, to look at the 360, not to just look at, at um, uh, a public relations campaign that, that you're orchestrating. She said, fine, fine. 
uh, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And a after talking to a couple of dozen people, I, I came back with a harrowing story that Jane hadn't come up with the experiment, that Jane had had, uh, had stolen uh, endorsements of the experiment, had concocted endorsements of the experiment, that Jane really was a grifter, and that the media, that that educators, that that students in education programs want to be teachers at universities and colleges all over the United States and the world had been had been sold a, a false bill of goods, um, and, and I decided to write about it. I mean, the blue eyes brown eyes experiment is really really well known. It, it and you know. Jane, for example, touts that uh, people have said it's the greatest thing to come out of education in the last 100 years. She quoted Robert Coles, a famous uh, Harvard psychiatrist, as saying that. Um, Jane is listed as one of the, the great venerated educators of the world, including Aristotle and Homer. Um, and it, it turns out that that we really we really swallowed something that that ought to have stuck in our throat. Yeah. But we swallowed. Yeah, I think um, and before we get too far down that, because I think there are lessons there for current events with people like Robin D'Angelo, who wrote a book called White Fragility. And she's white, <laughs> you know, basically scolding white people. You know, you should feel guilty. She's kind of the modern day Jane Elliott, I think. But just you kind of skipped over earlier, uh, you know, about how the experiment went. And most of us have the textbook version. What I liked about your book is you got you expanded on that greatly based on these interviews you did with these kids that are now adults, obviously. And, and they, you know, fulfilled, filled in some of the details. So let me just pick it up here and read a little bit from your book in that section uh, where she tells the kids it might be interesting to to judge people by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try? Elliot then pulled out green construction paper armbands and asked each of the blue-eyed kids to wear one. The brown-eyed people are better people in this room, Elliot began. They're cleaner and they're smarter. They are not, one blue-eyed boy said under his breath from the back of the room. Oh, yes, they are, Elliot said, her eyes wide open. She wagged her index finger at the blue-eyed boy with the audacity to question her. Brown-eyed people are more intelligent than blue-eyed people. It's about time you knew the truth. You're old enough to know this. Elliot issued more directives. All you brown-eyed children, push your desks to the front of the room. The children looked puzzled. You heard me. Push them to the front. You're the smarter kids. That's where you belong. <laughs> the comment didn't seem to register with the children, so Elliot repeated it. Go ahead, he told the brown-eyed group. You ought to be sitting up front. Blue-eyed children, push your desks to the back as far away as you can. She knew that the children weren't going to buy her pitch unless she came up with a reason. And the more scientific to these space-age children of the 1960s, the better. Eye color, hair color, and skin color are all caused by a chemical, Elliot went on, writing melanin on the blackboard. Melanin, she said, is what causes intelligence. The more melanin, the darker the person's eyes, and the smarter the person. Brown-eyed people have more of these chemical in their eyes, so brown-eyed people are better than those with blue eyes. Blue-eyed people sit around and do nothing. You give them something nice and they just wreck it. She could feel a chasm forming between the two groups of children. <laughs> anyway, so this goes on and on for pages. It's just astonishing. I've never seen this kind of detail of how she did this. So again, in terms of her temperament, you know, very conscientious, high, high in conscientiousness, obviously. High in, uh, low. I would say low in agreeableness, high in tough-mindedness, disagreeableness. You know, wagging the figure and, and finger in their face and, and barking out these orders. Yeah, again, this would never be approved today by any uh, research ed uh, ethical board. But um, but the question is this: um, What is it she's really doing here? You know, if we, let's let's think of it in the context of Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment. As you know, there's much debate about to what extent he kind of coached the prisoners and guards to act a certain way, and they just sort of followed his command or, you know, his instructions, or were they really obedient to authority, like Milgram's shock experiment subjects, or were they role-playing, or were they, I don't know, kind of a social proof, a social contagion, well, other people are doing it, so I'll go along, even though they don't really believe it. 
don't know. What's your sense about, since you talk to these kids that are now adults, what, what they thought they were doing when they were doing this? Uh, they were listening to their teacher. They were being good students. Um, you know, when you're, when you're in, is the part of the experiment was college students. Uh, th- these, <laughs> these kids are, uh, yeah. are eight, and nine years old. You know, if you talk to third grade, if you got, if, if we all remember, go back to when you were in the third grade, that's about the last time you really love your teacher. <laughs> you know, you just idolize your teacher, you lionize your teacher. You know, uh, your teacher's a role model. What your teacher says, it, it, you know, it is, is what's right. It's your teacher is your model, you know, uh, and, and ultimately what Jane did was to destroy that, that trust that, that, um, that youngsters have, you know, seven, eight years old. And and to say you're dumb, that sticks with people. That sticks with people. And and you know it it would have been one thing if it had stayed within the confines of of tiny Riceville, in a rural community in in the northeastern part of an agricultural state. But it, it spread like wildfire. Yeah. Um, you know this experiment was imported um, by eager teachers. Uh, who learned about it in Psychology 101, in teachers' colleges, in, in their classes that were required. Uh, you know, I, I found uh, it had been exported in 19, it had been 1971 to, uh, um, to New York City, to a, a, a private school in New York City called St. Anne's. And I, I talked to a woman who's in her late 50s who... Uh, who still remembers, she has brown eyes, by the way, who still remembers uh, what it was like to be ridiculed. And um, that experiment uh, yeah, was in the third grade. And, you know, in, until she was in the, in, in the uh, eighth grade, uh, her fellow classmates said, hey, dummy, dummy, you know, you've got brown eyes. Um, so uh, it, it this was an experiment that had, that that went amok, that ran amok, and and it would have been one thing if it had stayed there, but its simplicity uh, guaranteed that it it would it would um, get mileage, and it did really all over the world. There are anecdotes I have really from from Europe, uh, from Asia, from South America of of children who were exposed to this experiment, they still remember it. And now they're adults like you and me. You know, the problem with the experiment is uh, it was punitive. There was no empathy. There was no, let me understand what it's like to be. Let me understand what it's, how you feel. It was uh, based on punishment and ridicule. It was, it was a shock experiment. Um, and, you know, if, if for readers who, or excuse me, for listeners for, who are, um, who are our age, perhaps they can recall other social experiments like this. There, there was a guy who was very, very popular mm-hmm. in the mid seventies, Werner Earhart, who did something called Earhart seminar training. Um, and, and they get a lot of money and, uh, they, uh, lectured, in large hotel ballrooms, uh, putting people on the spot. Earhart's deal was you have to get it. Interestingly, it was never described, but you know, after paying a couple of thousand bucks, maybe at the end of the weekend, you would get it. Um, and you know, there's just something cruel. And, and I would even say evil about this. Um, and Jane, amassed quite a bit of power, I think, power over people. Um, Her former principal who stopped the experiment in Riceville um, called Jane a sadist uh, in enjoying inflicting pain on on, on people, having all the the cards, all the power. Um, 
uh, Jane certainly um, developed a persona, and that that persona was was someone who knew more than you, who was um, all knowing, all powerful. She was in control of the levers. She was um, the Wizard of Oz in, in many cases. And, you know, those who had to take her class, well, you know, the, the power differential was there. They were children or they worked for a U.S. West corporation. They worked for a corporation. They worked for the government and they were required to take this class. Uh, oftentimes, um, any, any salary increase was was tethered to successful completion of the class. Um, and so I, I think in a sense, Jane really turned into a professional bully. Um, in, instead of offering a, this loving, caring demonstration of why we ought to change our behavior for the better of person kind, uh, this was, uh, an exercise in shock. It was All right, so she does this on Friday, and then she comes back on Monday and flips it that the the other colored eyes are the smart ones and so forth. How did the how did her fellow teachers receive this, and or the school principal, and then the parents and the local town members? Let's start there with the reception of it. So um, Jane is a young, impressionable teacher. She's in her early thirties. Um, she's, she's put back in a, in a school where, where she went to high school, uh, in a, in a community where she went to high school and, um, there are a lot of older, very dedicated teachers. Um, and, and Jane, uh, went to the other teachers and said, what are you going to do to, um, alert our students of, of racism in America? What are you going to do to bring to life what happened to Dr. King? yesterday. What are you going to do to bring the realities uh, of the world, not of Iowa, not of tiny rice ball, to, to our students? That is our job after all. And, and they all looked at Jane like, like she was missing a screw. And um, according to Jane, uh, the day after King was assassinated, um, one teacher said to her, well, uh, uh, I thought it was about time that someone killed that SOB. Of course, that made Jane um, dig her heels in deeper, and Jane went back with um, uh, the authority and passion of a prophet, really. And and ultimately, Jane, in answer to your question, Michael, realized that you can't become a prophet in your own land. And Jane was roundly condemned and criticized by these teachers, one, because she developed a following of, of some students who just adored her. Jane was like a Pied Piper. And, you know, she is bright. She did bring in books that were not part of the reading curriculum. She bought them on her own. Um, she, she was a terrific creative teacher. When Jane taught multiplication tables, Jane didn't take out the old charts to figure out what nine by nine is. Jane had her kids bake chocolate chip cookies. And if you're going to put nine chocolate chips in 12 dozen cookies, how many chocolate chips do you need? So this becomes like a Pavlovian exercise. So for the rest of these kids' lives, whenever they smell chocolate chip cookies baking in an oven, they're going to think of multiplication tables. That's what Jane did. Jane created a ham radio station in her school. Jane created a, uh, a, a, um, a store in her school where if, if, uh, if Johnny wanted to bring in a couple of shirts because he outgrew them, he put them in an old refrigerator carton that, that had lettered on top general store and, and Billy could buy the shirts for five cents. And if he bought 20 shirts, uh, he'd have a dollar, and he'd have to pay a dollar to get um, to get the shirts. Jane was a really creative um, uh, spark plug. Um, 
that caused problems because the other teachers weren't as innovative. The other teachers just wanted to, to, to punch a time clock. And uh, so Jane developed um, a lot of, Jane had ambition. And ambition isn't oftentimes the best thing to, to display in, in small town America. People uh, started looking at her and started avoiding her at the post office, at the in the downtown area. Okay, to the chronology of the story. Um, the local newspaper did a piece on Jane a couple days after her first experiment was debuted. Somehow, that story got picked up, and uh, a researcher at the Johnny Carson Show, at the Tonight Show in New York City and Rockefeller Center, called up Jane. <laughs> and said, I've got someone who wants to speak to you. And it was Johnny Carson. Now, Johnny Carson happens mm -hmm. to be a native of Iowa. He grew up in Nebraska, but he was born in Iowa. And Johnny Carson got on the phone to Jane at Riceville Elementary School and said, would you like to appear on our show? Uh, remember, this is 1968. I mean, Carson is sort of the bellwether of America. He's sort of America's soothsayer. And... Um, and, you know, Carson had to do something to, to deal with the racial divide in America. And he figured, golly, gee whiz, let's have a let's have a civilian. Let's have someone from uh, my old home state and 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 maybe she'll say something important. But I don't want to make it too serious because this is a comedy show. And so Jane flew for the first time with her husband, Daryl. And they flew to the Big Apple and appeared on the show. And um, Jane uh, was whisked off after six minutes because uh, what Jane was talking about was serious stuff. It wasn't, uh, ah, shucks, you know, let's, let's shoot BBs into a, uh, into a, into a Coca-Cola machine. Or let's have a rooster singer. Let's have Tiny Tim get married, and that's what happened later on that year during um, the Johnny Carson show. But but Jane had those those Klieg lights on her, and and Jane's six minutes I think sort of propelled her into the national spotlight. And after that, uh, she was a goner. Jane wasn't going to go back and 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 teach uh, math the way it was taught. Jane uh, had a calling, and and that calling was to, so those... to change the world, and and in many ways, Jane I think became somewhat of a yeah, of a megalomaniac. I got that from the book. To what extent did the fellow teachers and townspeople resent that that she you know some some jealousy some you know look she's she's a she's a grifter she's just self promoting and, and nobody likes that in another person versus. The darker side, which I think you hinted at in the book, that is she suggesting we're all a bunch of racists here uh, and, you know, we don't like being accused of that? Or is she exposing a darker underbelly of, you know, rural America and we're not happy about the national spotlight being shown on our, you know, kind of darker side? When Jane came back from New York City, um, I, yeah, I think she expected... Uh, well, they don't have ticker tape parades in Riceville. They have <laughs> hay rack rides, you know. And I, I think she expected people to to collectively stand up and and applaud her, you know, maybe to 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 meet her at the Rochester Airport, Rochester, Minnesota Airport, and to wave placards and to to welcome their favorite daughter back. And uh, that's not what she got at all um generalizations are are difficult and they're inaccurate often but you know iowans particularly rural iowans or rural folks don't like to seek attention you know it, it, you know iowa is a very middle class rural iowa is a very middle class if you're wealthy you do your best to hide it if you're poor you do your best to hide it you want to be middle class you want to be like everyone else and Jane was sticking out and looking different. And, and implicitly, you're absolutely right. She was saying, um, 
we're a bunch of racists. And, and the locals thought, this, this is crazy. This is nonsense. We've never even met a black person. How can we be racist? I mean, the only, the only image of a black person we might have is on TV. And, and, but we've never met a black person. We're not racist. Um, and, and so Jane was snubbed. Uh, you know, it, Riceville became a little bit like Peyton Plays. Um, Jane went to the post office the, 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 after a couple of days and her best friend turned her back on her. Jane was uh, disinvited to uh, the bowling league. There's Riceville uh, Bowling Alley. It's now closed, but it used to be there. Um, Jane had a picnic with her uh, three children and her husband. And um, suddenly uh, it was canceled with another family. Um, the, the father of that family happened to be the local insurance agent. Well, you don't want to be seen with Jane Elliott. Jane Elliott had been on national TV. Jane Elliott had talked about, uh, about race. You know, Johnny Carson didn't even like it on TV. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to, to crack jokes. It's one thing to have Ed McMahon laugh and, and you know, do his uh, yo. But it's another thing to talk seriously about, about problems affecting America. You know, um, uh, it, 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 people didn't tune in the Carson show to get a lesson that, that we're racist or, or this is a way perhaps even to stop racism. But Jane was off and running. And, and while she was running, uh, she caused an awful lot of people back home uh, a lot of anguish and, and pain. And part of that was, was sheer envy. Part of that was embarrassment. Part of that was Jane's doing something that no one else has, do uh, has done. And why, why is she sticking out? You know, Northeastern Iowa is, is really a carpet of corn, particularly now, by the way. Uh, you know, the corn hasn't... Ha hasn't um, been cut and it's now about six feet tall and in, in many ways I, i'd like to think that that rural iowa sort of mimics that corn every every kernel is in its place and every ear is 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 in the is in the shuck and is um is like everyone else. And Jane was brave enough, courageous enough, and in a sense, opportunistic enough and optimistic enough to say, wait a minute, there's something wrong here and I wanna do something to, to change it. Her motives perhaps originally were pure, but as she became larger and, and more important and more national and more international, and as her, as her shadow um, became larger and larger, um, she became a caricature. And she became, uh, in many ways, uh, a, a source of, of, of information that did not serve, I think, America's interests mm. very well. Yeah, it's good to remember. So this is late 60s. You know, polls at that time would ask if a black family moved in to your neighborhood, would you move out? Or if your son or daughter wanted to marry a black person, would that upset you? Uh, those kinds of questions. And the percentages were fairly high. Uh, you know, and it's good to remember it wasn't until 1967 that the Supreme Court in the Loving case voted that uh, interracial marriage was the law of the land, just like same sex marriage in 2015. That's not that long ago, <laughs> you know, of, of how racist attitudes were. You mentioned the teacher that said it's about time somebody shot that SOB, King. Well, she surely wasn't the only one <laughs> in the town or, or in America who thought that. We know J. Edgar Hoover had uh, wiretaps on Dr. King's, you know, private uh, phone calls and microphones in his hotel rooms were uh, to record his trysts with his paramours in order to blackmail him. And even maybe when that one... Uh, memo to him suggest he may take his own life uh, rather before he gets exposed he turned that down 
um, you know, that again, <laughs> you know, the time she's doing this, it, you know, compared to today, it was a pretty dark period still in American history. So, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to her saying, you know, being a tough minded person that says, I want to do something, you know, much like the kind of culmination of racial tensions with the, um, the murder of, of, um, uh, sorry, it's just spaced out there. I was thinking of Michael Brown and then, um, George Floyd, you know, and then the BLM movement and, and so on, you know, we, you know, you see videos of that and you think somebody should do something about this. I, but what can I do? You know, I'm just, I have a, I'm just a nobody, just have some job. You know, I'm not the, the, the police captain. I'm not a mayor. I'm not a school teacher. I, you know, whatever. I, I What am I going to do? I, I want to do something. So I can kind of see uh, uh, Jane Elliott on the, on the uh, post Dr. King assassination, like somebody should do something. And she being high in conscientiousness, high in tough mindedness and disagreeableness, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something tomorrow. I'm a school teacher. I'm going to do that with my kids. And then, you know, maybe it would have just ended there. But, you know, the Tonight Show and then Oprah, you know, and Oprah does take on, did take on serious topics on her show. So I, I, I could kind of see how that would happen. And then the reception in the media, what you, cause you mentioned how, how much well received she was by the media and then corporations. And she's giving all these sensitivity training programs and so on. I can kind of see why. You know, it's like it's some big company says, well, we should do something. This is just awful what happened to Dr. King and all the other things. What can we do? You know, we, well, we don't pass legislation. What do, you know, we're just a company. Hey, we can bring this woman in and then we'll feel like we've done something. We've taught our employees, don't be racist. Now, we can talk in a little bit about whether it really does that or not. But, but you know, I can kind of see the motivation on the part of media and, and, and business and even politicians that, you know, we're making some progress here to do something about this problem. Uh, you know, yeah, Jane's original motives, I think, were pure. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, America was beset with racism. America still is beset with racism. Um, you know, th th this was a naive, uh, impressionistic, optimistic way to, to say, we're going to do something about this. We're going to bring in a trainer. Uh, we're going to pay her a lot of money. We're going to require all of our, our employees, all of our students to undergo diversity training, multicultural training. Um, uh, and, and, and presto, three days later, we're, we're going to be cured. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It, it, you know, you mentioned Robin D'Angelo. She's interviewed in the book. Um, and and, and uh, Ms. D'Angelo has some interesting things to say about Jane Elliott. Um, you know, we're, we're beset with with um, with issues, generational issues of racism. Um, and 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 Jane's idea is is great. It's a great idea, but in implementation, it doesn't work. It can't work. The, the, you know, Jane never met a black person before. And, and here's a white woman who is talking to white kids about how black people feel. Um, uh, you know, going off on, on this issue uh, of, you know, who teaches about the black experience. I'm a white man writing a book about a white woman who who purports to tell white children what it's like to be black in America. Um, and and I, I'm a journalist, I, I'm not a psychologist. Um, and I, I just, you know, I just descended into that community in Riceville and I just sat and listened and listened and listened and listened to more and more people. And, and I really came away with this, this portrait of a, of a town. Yes. That in, in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, was totally freaked about what it called a black invasion of America. They were freaked about towns not too, too far away that were, that were, that were being burned. Um, you know, places like Chicago, places like Detroit, they were, they were freaked that Jane Elliott, because of her, her, um, her say on the Johnny Carson show, was putting out the welcome mat to blacks. 
there were people, older people I talked to in Riceville who said, Jay was inviting Blacks to settle in our community. This, Michael, is preposterous. This is a farming community. You know, Blacks were not lining up to move to Riceville. Um, But there was concern that the Blacks who had moved to uh, a nearby city, Waterloo, um, after World War II, would come to Riceville. Um, you know, would would choose to to enroll their children. Totally bogus. This it wasn't going to happen. But there was concern that that blacks were going to were, were going to be in schools with with our white children, and, and worse that that blacks would begin dating our our daughters, and that there'd be intermarriage and. And, um, and and so Jane Jane lit a firecracker, and and um, and people didn't like it, and she was roundly turned out of that community. She ultimately left Riceville and moved about eighteen miles down the road. That doesn't sound like much miles. to city folks, but eighteen miles is a whole different world, a whole different cosmos. And um, her her children were, um, I, I think. I, I, I even knew three of the four, three of the four children, and they all actually interviewed all four children over the eighteen years it took me to to research the book. Uh, they were picked on, you know. Your mom is the is the is the end lover. Uh, they were beaten up, uh, and those children grew up with an attitude, um, and uh, only one. Two of the four children still live in the Riceville area, but they don't really like to to go public. They don't really like to to, to say who their mom is. Uh, and, and Jane Jane is in her mid eighties. Uh, occasionally, she does a media presentation, um, <coughs> but she, for a lot of interesting, good and bad reasons, she's battered and bruised. Uh, she's she's led a life, a, a, a rough and tumble life based on this ornery sense that uh, I can teach what it's like to be black in America, even though I'm a white mm. person. What was uh, how did the Oprah thing work out? And she did multiple episodes on that. Um, what were some of the things that discussed? Was she on for the full hour each episode? So. Um, before Oprah went national, Oprah had a Chicago show. It was the uh, uh, the morning show, and it was it was just broadcast in Chicago. And um, uh, Oprah, after the Carson show, after lots of different um, uh, media portrayals of Jane Elliott, Oprah invited Jane to appear, and she did the experiment on a studio audience just in Chicago. Uh, it was a risky thing for Oprah. Uh, I mean, Oprah, I don't think, wanted to to anger um, the at-large Chicago uh, viewing audience, blacks and whites and everyone else. Uh, But when Oprah went national, um, Jane was also asked to appear, and she, uh, she imparted the experiment on the studio audience. It failed miserably. Um, people act, it was, it was televised live and, and Oprah, um, shared with the viewers at home what was happening, but the 70 or so, uh, uh, audience members were not told just like the students were not told that this was an experiment. Um, and, and Jane, uh, went on national TV on Oprah and, and said, you know, if you've got blue eyes, you're dumb. You're genetically inferior. And Oprah in Soto voice said, it's just an experiment. <laughs> Let's just go with it. <laughs> and the student, excuse me, not the students, the, the audience turned on, on Oprah and, and turned on Jane Elliott. And, and some of them stomped out. And, and Jane, uh, who's, you know, a tough cookie, said, I'm glad you're not here because... Uh, you don't have the intelligence to understand what I'm doing. And, you know, so, so Jane became a bully. She became 
an out and out sadist, but she contends she did it for the right reasons. Um, ultimately, Jane appeared on five Oprah shows. Um, and uh, Jane and Oprah parted um, not very amicably. Uh, I think Oprah became too wise and Oprah became uh, too political to um, uh, run the risk of, of Jane um, running this experiment on TV. Too many loopholes. There, there's too much potential litigation. There, there's too much uh, uh, turmoil in the wake of this. Uh, it, 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 it's an upsetting, difficult experiment. And uh, it, it, it leaves victims in its wake. Um, and, and ultimately, it's a shocking experiment. And, you know, in many ways, you know, our media today um, thrives on shock. It, shri- it, it's, it thrives on, on just a, a amazing reality TV, whether it really is reality or not. Um, and, and, and so in many ways, Jane was, was one of the early pioneers, I think, in, 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 in shock experiments. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, you know, that was the era of that, the Stanford prison experiment. All those uh, kind of social contagion type uh, social psych experiments like the smoke in the room uh, where uh, we replicated a bunch of these for Dateline NBC back in 2010, um, where um, Chris Hansen was the host. And we did the we did the Milgram shock experiment. We actually built a a box with the toggle switches and. We had uh, contestants, just volunteers from the public, uh, trying out for this reality TV show called What a Pain that was going to air on NBC, uh, right? So they were motivated. To, and so all you got to do is, you know, flip these switches when the learner gets the gets the uh, word pair wrong. And, and so that was rather amusing. We did the smoke in the room where everybody in the room is is a shill working for us, except for the one person we're filming. And everyone keep, continues filling out their little form to be on this TV show as we're pumping theater smoke in underneath the door. And, you know, like everybody gets on an elevator, everyone on the elevator is a shell working for us, except the one person who walks in and everybody turns around and faces the back wall. And our guy turns around and faces the back wall. And so I, I got to thinking watching, you know, as we were doing this, you know, are they, is it really a sign of human gullibility and kind of stupidity or, or, or just, you know, sheepleness of going along with the crowd or is it a little, something a little more logical, socially that what's called social proof that you know no one can possibly fact check everything and uh and and so we kind of rely on other people for our information and usually that's pretty good i mean if there was really smoke in a room and and it was really a threat most people would get up and leave (laughs) and there's probably some reason why everyone's turning around to face the back wall so i should probably do that um and you know so i I could kind of see you know the value of of that to a certain extent as you know, reality TV shock value, but does it really show something that we want to know? That is something deep in human nature that's a certain way. Like I've been writing recently about this theory called um, default to truth. To what extent do we just believe whatever people tell us? Now, the people who promote this theory kind of present it as if humans are kind of suckers, gullible. You know, we're not very skeptical. We just follow what everybody, anyone tells us. But the fact is, how can I possibly fact check everything the president says or whatever? I can't. You know, this is why we need people like you, you know, hardened newspaper men that are going to do the, you know, the the shoe leather fact checking for me. And I can rely on that uh, because I can't do it. Right. So it's not that I I'm a fool for believing what everybody tells me. It's that that usually works because most people don't just make stuff up and lie and so on. Um, and it's rare, it, the rare times that they do, they can kind of get away with it because most of the time people reasonably accept it, you know, like cult leaders, you know, why would anybody follow Jim Jones to South America or, um, or David Koresh to Waco or, uh, Joseph Smith or Brigham Young to Utah? Well, because most of the time, most religious leaders are good people. They don't lie. They're not turning their religions into cults. You know, it's, it's reasonable to do that. And, you know, so I, I always wonder about those kinds of experiments and what they really tell us. Well, look, what would have happened if there really was smoke? 
people would have jumped up <laughs> left, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. What, what happens if there really was smoke? What happens if there really was a fire? Well, I mean, what happens if, if Jim Jones had been right? You know, if, if Jim Jones was, was, was the, um, the prophet he claimed to be, if, if he was the, um, uh, the password to, to go, you know, to, to heaven, um, what happens if Jane had been right? If, if you could erase racism in three days, if you could simulate racism and, and create such an impact in an impressionable seven year old brain that that person for the next 75 years and generations after that um, would preach the evils of racism. It's, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's a pretty good risk, right? If, if we're going to put some people on the line, um, this sounds like a pretty good uh, opportunity to do it. And, you know, it, uh, I'm culpable with this. You know, I, I wrote an article for uh, Smithsonian Magazine. You know, Smithsonian is, you know, part of, as I said, the Smithsonian Institution. It's, it's ultimately a seeker of truth. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it turns out, you know, there's a sucker born every day and, and it turns out it's too good to be true. It, it turns out that, that, you know, it's punitive. It's, it, we're, we're going to simulate racism um, and, and with the hope that we're going to make such an impact in your brain, how, how horrible how racism is that, that you're going to be a crusader against it. The, the problem is, Lying in the wake of all that is a lot of damage. Is a lot of destruction. Is is, is uh, the, the kind of, of psychological, real psychological torment that an experiment like that can impart on on a seven year old, an eight year old, a forty year old. Um, you know, it, it's really it's a sense of brain control. It's a sense of brainwashing, um, and and it's. It, 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 it doesn't work, but, you know, yeah, we're gullible. Yeah, we're gullible for all the right reasons. We're gullible to survive. We don't want to be perished. We don't want to perish in the fire. That's why when, when there's smoke, we're going to run away from the elevator. You know, we're going to run away. You know, that's why we're going to follow Jim Jones and, and David Koresh. You know, if this guy's got the answer, I, it's a good bet that you know, he seems logical. He seems smart. He seems sincere. Uh, you know, you mentioned Joseph Actually, Smith. In, yeah, I mean, in that case, the Jim Jones story is pretty interesting because he was quite the pioneer in racial relations in the San Francisco area. He worked closely with Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown. You can see pictures and videos of him on online of him meeting with all the top politicians in California, and he was one of the pioneers of integrating his church and bringing blacks in and whites and manning the soup kitchens and helping the, the you know, the people of color in, in the Bay Area. And it's like, if you were part of that, you would not think, well, this is going south and I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid. No, you'd think I'm doing something about race relations. Again, this is around the same time in the 70s. And, uh, you know, you would have no idea. I'm fond of saying no one in the history of the world has ever joined a cult. They join a group that they think is good. And it's pretty rare that they turn out to be, you know, a dangerous, deadly cult like that. Most of the time, you know, nothing bad happens like that. So, yeah. So the question is, what should we do about it? Oh, I was going to ask you at, at the University of Iowa, do they have, do you have to take sensitivity training programs, those online programs, like once a year, every two years, like, like we do at Chapman University where I teach? Yeah, indeed, we do. All the faculty members are required to take online um, uh, training in, in, um, it, I don't know if it's sensitivity training. It, it's training in in learning uh, about how other cultures live, and 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 just it, you know, in a sense, it's very much like what Jane did. It's 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 walking a mile in someone else's shoes. Uh, yeah, so we do need to do that, and um, I don't think it's bad. I I I I learn an awful lot. I learn a lot by listening. Um, you know, it's two or three hours. I don't mind that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't look at it as 
as brainwashing. Um, it, it's no, not brainwashing, you know, but but the question is, does it work? I mean, is it really going to change my attitudes if I'm a homophobe or transphobe or or a racist or misogynist? And I read these little online scenarios and listen to the conversations that the people have, and then I have to answer some questions, multiple choice questions. I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure, you know, if we had, if we have the science to show that actually works. In fact, the science shows it probably doesn't work in, in the same way that Jane Elliott's experiments didn't work to change the attitudes of these kids. Cause that probably requires something much deeper and long-term like these kind of decade long social shifts. I mentioned those surveys, the, the polls in the like fifties and sixties, you know, would you move out if a black family moved in, you know, the, the numbers now are just, low or they don't even ask them anymore because it, it, it's just an idiotic question. We've come that far, but it's taken, you know, like 60, 70 years to get there. Uh, slow enough, you don't quite notice it. It's not like something reported on the evening news. Oh, look, people are less racist than they used to be, you know, but it has happened slowly. And I'm not sure to what extent these kinds of training programs work, uh, you know, like, but all these corporations are doing it, not just universities, but you know, they all you know, they bring in um, like Ibram X. Kendi to give talks about this. And again, I can see why they do it. You know, they feel like we're doing something and or there's legal reasons. Maybe, you know, we we've covered ourselves. So if we get sued for some discrimination or if one of the employees does something like a sexual assault on a fellow employee and that person has gone through the sensitivity training programs, the corporation of the university can say, hey, look, we put that guy through the program. We did what we could. We didn't know he, you know, he was a nut job and was going to do this crazy thing. So don't sue us, right? You know, sometimes I think cynically there's some, you know, kind of legal reasons to put people through those. Um, but <laughs> just to kind of put a funny point on it, you know, when I read these scenarios, like, you know, you overhear a couple people uh, uh, talking and one of them tells an off-color joke about, you know, women or blacks or Jews or whatever. You should a uh, repost the joke online because it's funny. B intervene and give a talk and explain to them why that was inappropriate or see call hr human resources the answer is always call hr right <laughs> so you know yeah. and when i read this i go yeah. oh come on yeah. you know what what is this really doing <laughs> um you know what what jane did was she she turned the dial all the way up you know if if the if the volume was 1 to 10 she turned it on to 100 um, you know, if she could actually try to make someone feel in her mind how a black person feels, her mind, by the way, as a white person, uh, it, maybe it would it would stay with that person. You know, look, what's the way to get rid of racism? There is no way. The only way to get rid of racism, I suppose, is to is to understand that that the human condition, you know, like, like to start getting to know a white person, a black person, an Hispanic person, a Jew, uh, uh, you know, look, I, I'm at the age when you didn't vote for, black people didn't vote for John F. Kennedy because he was Catholic. There was never a Catholic president. You know, we don't want Catholics, you know, in politics, and certainly as president. You know, you couldn't get a divorced person. You know, that was a huge deal when, um, uh, when Jerry Ford actually was appointed president, when Nelson Rockefeller uh, ran for president, he's divorced. You know, we're, we're getting over this, but it takes, as you point out, an awfully long time. And it really takes, like, to get to know someone, um, you know, to get to know someone who's different from you and realize that, you know, they got the same issues that we've got. They've got, you know, to pay their rent at the end of the month. They've, they've got a, a, a child who, isn't behaving the way, you know, that child ought to. They, they've got the same issues that everyone else has. Um, but, but you know, G Jane perhaps was too optimistic, you know, and she was too zealous, and she just wanted all this to happen with a snap of her fingers, and it can't happen that way. Um, punishing people isn't the way to, to get people to understand what it's like to be different. You know, um, so, so the latest issue at, in colleges is, um, you know, uh, is is gender issues, trans issues, um, mm -hmm. so-called queer issues, and yep, yep. Um, 
you know, it, it's rather interesting, but here I am in, in Iowa, you know, the state university, and really in the last five years, probably in every one of my classes, I've had uh, a student who identifies as trans. And, you know, I'm thinking, gee, if that's in Iowa, imagine what it is in Los Angeles, what it is in New York. And you know what? Two things happen. The, it's not a big deal. And, and no one ribs the kid. No one says anything. It's just like, like you've got blue eyes, you've got brown eyes. It's, it's like, so what? And, and so, you know, there's this, this optimistic sense that I have of, you know, it's like, okay. So, you know, the kid's left-handed. You know, there was a time when you were really discriminated against because you were left-handed. My mother had her left hand uh, tied behind her back, you know, as, as, uh, as a student. She had to be taught to write with her right hand. So I, I think we're getting to this level of like, so you're trans or so you're pansexual. So you're, you're cisgender. So you're, you know, you were a, you know, a hat all the time. You were, you know, a, a veil. I don't really care. It doesn't make any difference. Um, and, and so I, I think this is good. I, I think we, we've sort of developed this sense of, uh, I'm really just interested in what you bring to the table, what you bring to the table as a student, as a person. I don't really care about you know, how you're dressing. I don't care about what you do, you know, off on your own. Uh, I don't care about who you go out with. Uh, and so, so, you know, Jane was, was this rabid optimist who just sort of went a little off the rails 50 yeah. years early. Reminds me a little bit of... Um... She reminds me a little bit of Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was at the time, also around the time that Jane was working, they called the, the most hated person, most hated woman in America. You know, she was a rabid atheist. And, um, you know, atheists like me, you know, I, I'm not very militant about it. You know, I don't really care what somebody believes as long as they leave their religion out of, of politics or science. Um, and, you know, don't try to convert me <laughs> or whatever. You know, it doesn't really matter. I'm not trying to make people atheists through my work. You know, if they get there because of, you know, my work, okay, fine. But Madeline, you know, like others, maybe Christopher Hitchens, you know, was much more in your face. Like, you know, you're an idiot to believe in God. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, right? That's going to shut down conversation, and people don't like to hear that. Um, yeah, okay, so, right, these are, oh, I was going to say, I, I think what, there is some evidence that being exposed to people and getting to know them, gays or blacks or Jews or whatever, um, then it, it, it does lead it to it being more uh, kind of okay or acceptable or, or, or not something that's a big deal, as you said. So that's good. I'm kind of of a mixed mind to what extent you can force that, you know, say through affirmative action hiring or diversity, equity, inclusion is all the thing now in academia um, versus it happened naturally. You know, um, uh, you know, I think it is good we have a first black woman Supreme Court justice for a variety of reasons. I think that's good. Um, on the other hand, I wouldn't want the policy to believe, be we're going to focus on people's skin color as the most important thing about them. Because I would like to live in a world where it's the least important thing. I just, I don't even care. I mean, what difference does it make? It's like, how many blondes versus redheads versus brunettes do we have in Congress? I have no idea. I don't care. What difference does it make? Or in your case, blue eyes versus brown eyes. How many blue eyed, brown eyed Congress people do we have? I have no idea. And I don't think we should figure it out because it doesn't matter. Right. But it does matter uh, on skin color. We're still not there yet where people go, who, you know, like in Seinfeld, you know, about the, the gay issue, you know, like not that there's anything wrong with it. Right. You just almost joke about it. Like gay, whatever, dude, who cares? Right. Um, we're not there yet. And I, you know, I just, I thought maybe when I was younger, we'd get there by the time I'm now 67, that, you know, we'd be, you know, sort of a post-race America. And, you know, a lot of us thought, well, Obama, you know, that's going to do it. Well, that didn't do it. Um, and so I don't, I don't know what it's going to take to get there. You know, race, it's often been said as a social construct. Uh, I mean, what is, what is a black person? What's a white person? I mean, how, 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 how white you have to be to be called white, you know, you know, uh, if you, 
if you grew up in Mexico, are you white? It will, I mean, did, you, did your ancestors come from Spain? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a social construct. Um, and it really ought not to make any difference because it's really something that we impart meaning to. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's the left-handed, right-handed business. It's the blue eyes, brown eyes. It's like, I'm really not that concerned about whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes. You know, I, I'm really concerned what you bring to the table. Um, and, and, you know, the atheism issue is huge. Oftentimes, you know, students will say to me, uh, Merry Christmas. I, I happen to be Jewish. Um, and, and I have to go through that moment when I say, Oh, do I want to deal with Fox News? Do you want to, you know, or, or oh, okay. Hey, how about just, how about just Mary? Why do you have to say Merry Christmas? It's not a holiday for me. And then they might say, well, you're Jewish, the Merry, uh, Happy Hanukkah. And I have to say, but, you know, Hanukkah is not that kind of, of, just say, you know, have a nice time, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's always that point. You're absolutely right. There's always that point. When you're going to have to, when you hear something that upsets you, that is wrong, that 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 rubs you the wrong way, that sticks in your craw, are you going to say something about it? You know, you're at a, you're at you're a guest at someone's country club, and someone tells an off color joke about women. Do you want to stand up and say, "I don't find that funny at all"? Someone says an off color joke about about uh, blacks. Well, you you know, yeah. At that point, you're going to you're going to feel rotten if you don't say something and you have to be a white person who, who happens to feel this can't go on. This is 2022. It can't go on. So, you know, in America and perhaps in other places, you know, we, we understand what our limits are and what we're going to hold people's feet to the fire for and whether we're going to just let it slide. Um, you know, it, it, it's a it's a daily conflict. Um, you know, when are you going to when are you going to call someone out on something? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, Jane I think, Elliott's idea is you have to pick your battles. Yeah, I mean, hopefully you. you yeah, you have to pick your battles. You know, we, we hope that that in 2022, intelligent, learned, smart people are are not going to say dumb, stupid things. And when they do, um, as you point out, you got to pick your battles and you have to say, you can't say that. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right. You know, well, it, it kind of reminds it, me it, though, a little bit like when the, the, the ACLU would sue over separation of church and state issues, like uh, somebody put a cross up on the interstate highway where a car, it was somebody was killed in a car accident. You know, and they would sue because that's a violation of the First Amendment. You can't, you know, the government, it's a public road, the government's favoring a religion. You know, this is not a battle I would fight. It's like, you know, I don't know no, who's hurt by this. No one's being offended by it. Um, you know, but on the other hand, if you're teaching creationism in a public school instead of evolution because you think the Bible has the correct creation story, I'm, I am going to object to that because, first of all, it's exclusion, exclusionary of other religious origin stories. It is a violation of the First Amendment. The kids are not being taught the science and so on. If you want to open your own private Christian school and teach creationism, okay, that's your business. I, I have no business in that. Uh, I'm not going to hire your kids to work at my, I don't know, <laughs> my medical school or something if they don't understand evolutionary biology. But, you know, whatever, you see my point. Um, and, you know, at a party or something, I guess it, it would be good if the norms had shifted where people didn't feel comfortable telling off-color jokes about blacks and women and Jews and so on. Uh, if I guess if the norm was people aren't going to find this funny, so I I think I'll just keep my mouth shut rather than forward this joke. Uh, versus it being kind of harmless. Bill Maher was riffing about this the other day on uh, his show about that joke. There, there's a uh, uh, what was it? There's only two. Uh, no, wait. All women are bi. The only question is, is it sexual or uh, polar? And, you know, some comedian wrote the joke and for, and posted it and then somebody forwarded it and that person got in big trouble for forwarding it. And then, you know, 
Maher is a comedian and very liberal, you know, so he's like, it's just a joke. Just blow it off. It's a throwaway joke. So just throw it away. All right. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. Do you forward it? You know, I wouldn't forward that joke. Um, you know, but I wouldn't try to cancel somebody who did forward the joke on Twitter. I don't know. That's, that's, you know, it's one of those, it would be, I prefer, I guess, if jokes like that weren't forwarded around, but it's not a big deal. I don't know. It's sometimes it's a tough call in those gray areas. So I'm like you, I'm not a believer. Um, you know, I'm an atheist. I, 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 I love my Jewish heritage, but do I believe in God? Absolutely not. Um, Occasionally in my classes, I I, I, I I will get someone who's offended by my, um, I never talk about personal stuff like that, but I'll get someone who's offended by, by my um, uh, not heralding God, by, by not paying homage to a, a higher source and you know a higher power and um you know that's one of the nice things about being at a public university um you know i, I i'm there to teach I, I i don't i don't hew to any any line except a, a, an approach of trying to teach students but just how to observe how to write clearly how to think clearly originally um, but but we have reached this degree that is um, where it becomes difficult. It becomes difficult to be an institution because we're in a litigious society. And um, for example, you know, I, I teach a class in journalism ethics, and um, as I used to work for the Los Angeles Times as a criminal courts reporter, and uh, you know unless someone is convicted of a crime, there are no victims. And I was trying to teach this, you know, it's an alleged victim, you know, so you're an alleged victim, mm -hmm. you know, if, if someone for the, is for the alleged perpetrator, right? That's absolutely right. Um, you know, you're the alleged rapist, you're the alleged killer uh, until you're convicted in a court. And at that point you can be a rapist, you could be a killer and ultimately if you consider it's like you're a victim. Um, and I, I tried to explain that, and I was unable to, to the satisfaction of, of, a, of a group of, of students who, who said, that, you know, if you've been raped, you're a victim. And I say, you know, rape's a legal term, like drunk. You know, drunk is a legal term. It's 0 0.08, or depending on the state you're in, it's 0 0.10 uh, alcohol level, blood alcohol level. Uh, and I understand where you're coming from, but legally, you can't call someone drunk, you know, legally, in, unless they have been adjudicated to have been at a, at a 0 0.08 blood alcohol level. You can't call someone a rapist. You know, uh, you're, you're going to get into trouble if you do that legally. Uh, you know, someone has to be adjudicated as having committed a rape. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that's how it is, but that's how this system that, that, that we believe in exists. And, um, you know, it, you know, in, in my world, I, I got in trouble for that. And the administration said, you know, what's this all about? And I explained, really, yeah. And, and I was told that's fine. You went, you, you made the case and you made it well. And, and but, um, anyway, to the point, to the point here with Jane, uh, you know, Jane, Jane is a social justice advocate. Um, and she just went off the rails. She ran them up. She, she was too eager. Uh, and it affected her personally, I think. And she became, um, she, she became too close to uh, a megalomaniac. Uh, she, she just, you know, her experiment just appealed to people for so, for so you, many reasons. Have you heard? Have you heard from her since? I haven't heard out? from Jane. I haven't heard from her at all. And, you know, I, I this is, we live in a litigious society and I, I made sure that I, I, I took very good notes and I recorded everyone and the book is just loaded with footnotes. Um, and, um, you know, 
I'm loath to give anyone anonymity and I tried to keep people uh, not to give anonymity to people who told me stories. I, I tried to keep them on the record. Um, but I have not heard from Jane. And, um, you know, as I, as I keep on saying, um, Jane's motives are right. James, you know, per, perhaps Jim Jones's motives were, were absolutely laudable, but, um, but somehow Jane and other people who become zealots sort of got carried down the stream um, too rapidly and, um, and, and, and their truth no longer became a, a truth that, that ought to have been shared with many people. And for all the reasons we've discussed, this truth was just broadcast and multiplied and replicated as this is the way to end racism. In fact, in many ways, it was a way, is a way to, to dive deeper into racism. Um, it was a way to, to, to make hardcore racists more racist. Um, it, you know, it gave people reason to, to be angry. Uh, it separated and divided people instead of unifying them. It really had no sense of empathy of, you know, we're all in the same boat. Let's try to understand each other. You know, Rodney King, right? Um, there was none of that. Right. Yeah. Can't we all just get along? Yeah. Right. Well, Steve and I, I don't, I would be mindful of your time. I love the book. I hope every psychologist, especially textbook writer, reads this before they write that section and they update it. But before I let you go, I, I did want to ask you some issues about journalism that concern me that I'm sure must concern you a couple. So let's just start with, if, if you don't mind taking a few extra minutes, the state of journalism today. What about uh, local newspaper, the demise of local newspapers? What effect do you think that'll have on the importance of, you know, truth in a, de in a liberal democracy and how we have to have kind of an agreed upon truth, like elections mostly work pretty well, for example. <laughs> and, uh, and then also the kind of the economic model of supporting journalism and how rapidly that's changed because of the internet and so on. What what are your thoughts since you've been doing this for a long time of how things have changed and are you concerned about the future? Yeah, to say I'm concerned is an understatement. Um, the, the model of American journalism is over. Um, you know, in, in a lot of the books that I write, I, I just love pouring over newspapers from the early 20th century. And, you know, not only was the competition, five and six and seven newspapers per urban center, um, uh, but there was deep investigative reporting. There was, uh, there's an, a wonderful motto, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's the job of a reporter. Um, that doesn't exist any longer. Um, reporters are no longer watchdogs. Reporters are, are public relations people. Reporters are the parlances, Stratcom, they're strategic communicators. Um, in terms of local journalism, um, if there is any local journalism, it's run by, by monolithic chains, um, chains like Gannett. Um, if they don't know about their own communities. They don't care about their own communities. They care about one thing, um, trying to post an eight to 10% profit every year. Um, uh, you know, democracy always was the cornerstone of democracy. Excuse me, journalism was always the cornerstone of democracy. You know, you learn that that your politicians are crook, you vote them out. Um, now the politician owns the newspaper. Um, you know, we deal with someone like Rupert Murdoch, uh, you know, who, who strongly, staunchly supported Donald Trump. That, that, that I read a piece today that's starting to change a little bit. But what does that augur for us? You know, the, you know, you know, the, the the audience. Um, so, local journalism is kaput. It, it, I mean, it's it's it, there's you know the point of journalism is to make meaning out of reality, and there is very little meaning that's in in most newspapers. You know, they are ad sheets. Um, uh, one of the positive sides of, of journalism is what's happening, for example, in Chicago, um, where there are um, uh, nonprofit corporations that are that are taking over newspapers. That's what's happened with the Chicago Sun Times. That's happened with WBEZ, um, uh, a not-for-profit radio station. Um, you know there are some philanthropists. This is this is 
weird and dangerous. You know, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Well, that's good and that's bad. He's got all the money in the world and the paper is improving and he knows something about the internet. Um, but I'm, I'm also concerned about the Rupert Murdoch's, um, you know, of the world, you know, as, as popularized by succession, the Brian Cox um, um, series on, on um, pay TV. Um, so journalism, as we know, it has changed. Um, you know, I, I must say that all of my students are mesmerized by TikTok and by Instagram. Um, you know, a long story is is five seconds. You know, you, the book that you that you love so much, Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes. Well, that's about one hundred twenty thousand words. I don't get that many students who can read one hundred twenty thousand words. They don't want to read it. They've been spoiled by. Um, uh, Snooky, and they've been spoiled by Kim Kardashian, and they've been spoiled by the visual. Um, so I think journalism is in is in deep shape, deeply bad shape. And I'm I, I think the election of Donald Trump uh, shows how did that happen? You know, how, how did that happen with journalism? Journalism is the cornerstone of democracy. It's it's comforting the afflicted. It's afflicting the comfortable. It's calling a spade a spade. It's when someone cheats and lies and steals that we hold them accountable. We're not seeing that. It's expensive. It's litigious. Um, how many people read the New York Times, even online? Not enough. Um, you know, in your own city, Los Angeles, I used to work for the LA Times, like an amazing paper, you know, where stories could run um, three, five, 10,000 words with jumps inside. Um, you know, column one was a famous American institution on page one of wonderful readers uh, that that hold politicians accountable. We don't see that much anymore because there's not that much money in it. Um, I don't look at CNN. I don't look at MSNBC because uh, I don't think I'm getting the whole truth. I don't think I'm even getting close to the truth at those places. Yeah, I'm a skeptic um, and I don't. Where do you go? Where do you go for your reliable sources? I, I go to places like the the Guardian, the London Guardian, only because I, I read it, and I, I know that there is, uh, you know, left bias to that, and I am aware of that. Um, but I think the reporting is pretty good. Um, I go to um, um, some PBS uh, shows. Uh, I, I like some of the reporting of NPR. Um, I go to podcasts like Skeptic, by the way. I go to places that I understand um, <laughs> there's a point of view and I acknowledge that and I want to go deeper into that point of view. You know, there's some PBS stuff that's great. I think Judy Woodruff is great. Um, but, you know, the journalism that, that we love is gone. It's in a different iteration today. People turn on TV to, to, to get um, sort of verification of what they already thought. They're not getting uh, truth and knowledge. They're just getting an echo of, of their own preconceived notions. Um, I, you know, so yeah, I, I don't feel san so sanguine about, about American journalism today. Uh, I think it's changing and I think it's changing for the worse. The, the the only the only light there is in as I mentioned earlier in um, in nonprofit organizations that are are trying to create a viable alternative. Um, I mean, you know, and, and there are a lot of them out there. Um, whether they're going to exist and flourish and have the kind of money to do the kinds of investigations that the New York Times doesn't do as much of as they used to, or that the Washington Post can do, um, I don't know. Um, but I really believe that our two-party system is in, um, is in a shambles because in part, democracy doesn't flourish because journalism is in active in, in, in doing its, its job of, of holding our officials um, to feet to the fire. One, one is, you know, the, the, the Times doesn't print um, all the news 
that's fit to print. It prints all the news it wants to print. And, um, you know, it, 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 a, 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 a brief example. Um, you know, Times was run by by a lot of, of white men for years and years and years. It still is, um, and it 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 took um, almost six hundred gay men to die before the Times ran the first story on AIDS on page one. For, for a lot of reasons. One, because um, in the 80s, there was a stigma about being gay. And you know, no one at the Times wanted to say, I'm gay. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a family newspaper. Uh, and, you know, somehow gay and the transmission of AIDS doesn't, like, make for a family newspaper. But almost 600 gay men had died. You know, it took Rock Hudson, really, it took Rock Hudson to die of AIDS, who was absolutely the opposite of the prototypical gay man, you know, and then it took Liberace, of course, um, you know, to die of AIDS before it became like a national epidemic. And so, you know, this is a little riff on my own about, you know, the Times. The Times has always printed the establishment story. They never printed the story about blacks. They never printed the story about Hispanics. They never printed, they printed the stories that affected the people put out the paper. It's the news that fit. Um, so, you know, newspapers have always printed, you know, what the people put out the newspaper thought was interesting. Um, and, you know, you know that, that's why you mentioned earlier George Floyd. I mean, Black people who knew for years, for centuries, there were there were lynchings that took place. You didn't see lynchings in the newspaper. You know, it, it took a it took a white officer, you know, who had his his boot on this man's neck for thirteen minutes. You know, for the world to see this is what blacks have encountered for years and years and years. You know. Um, driving while black, but you never saw those kinds of stories. You still don't see many of those kinds of stories in agenda setting newspapers. So, you know, we can glorify, you know, the good old days and talk about the wonderful newspapers and, you know, all the resources that, that, that papers like, you know, the LA Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post can throw at something, but it's always been a white person's agenda. It's always been a, uh, it's always been an establishment agenda. You know why? Because the point of the newspaper is to make money. The point of the newspaper is to make money for shareholders. You know, it's not to make money for, um, you know, the people who are casual readers, the people who even are regular readers. The point of the newspaper is to get people to buy the paper every day and actually more importantly, to get advertisers to advertise in the paper every day. There's an apocryphal story I'll tell you about um, when Rupert Murdoch bought the New York Post and Rupert Murdoch read the New York Post, and he called his friend Alfred Bloomingdale, the owner of Bloomingdale's, and said, hey, I want you to advertise in the New York Post. And Alfred Bloomingdale told Rupert Murdoch, your readers are our shoplifters. Why would we want to advertise to them? You know, it's all about demographics. You know, the Times can make a lot of money because it's, it's, the, it's the creme de la creme uh, of readers out there, the right demographics. You know, they don't, you know, and that's changing because those who make up those those prima demographics are changing. And the newspaper has has an obligation to 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 re report and 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 respond to um, issues of interest to all of its readers. But, you know, so journalism is changing. Journalism is changing and it's changing because because I have to say, in part uh, of some efforts of affirmative action some efforts that, you know, have made a, a real marked impact on how the news is reported. The example of, of, of uh, 600 men had to die before AIDS was reported. Unconscionable. You know, the, the, look, I, I, I hate to be um, um, talking like 
a Marxist because I'm not. But the, the job of the newspaper is one thing, to make money. There, there's no political, the only politics is to make money for shareholders. I mean, you know, let's be real about this. You know, when Gannett goes into a small community, their marching orders aren't to cover the court system. Their marching orders aren't, you know, you know, to to report about, you know, the school board and and, you know, and, and, and contractors who are actually relatives of the school board members. Their job is to is to sell ads, to sell subscriptions. If by chance reporting the news increases the advertising increase, and increases the subscription great Gannett and other chains are all for that so i mean the bottom line is to make money it, it it's, it's not an art you know it's not a, it's not it's not some monolithic conspiracy of of liberals and conservatives it's to appeal to your readers and advertisers want to appeal to a certain class of readers that's why the wall street journal appeals to businessmen and increasingly business women you know, it, it's a it's a direct ticket into into their minds. Um, anyway, my thoughts. Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, I like that. I had um, going to mention um, Batya Unger Sargon's book, Bad News. I had her on the show, and uh, you know, she's kind of an old school liberal, progressive, really. And her book is about the shift in journalism from, like, say, the nineteen eighteen nineties through the nineteen forties where it was that kind of shoe leather covering the, what was the phrase, you know, make, make the rich uncomfortable or, or the afflicted, uh, you know, the afflicted comforted or whatever. It's not like that anymore. And she, she places some of the blame on journalism schools and journalists now being trained at these elite uh, J schools. And they're not like common people, meat and potato kind of, you know, uh, working class on the beat journalists reporting what, those people are doing and how their lives are. In fact, they're super elite, well-educated now, probably doing exactly what you just said, uh, kind of appealing to the higher brow, super educated elites, even in the, whether they're left or right doesn't really matter. And that then probably fits that economic model you just described. You know, it's not that much money in shoe leather reporting. Um, you know, you, you want to make some money as a journalist, you go into business reporting. You go into reporting about Apple. You go into reporting about um, um, uh, about Silicon Valley. There's a lot of money in that. Um, uh, you know, uh, personally, my idols were Mike Royko and and Jimmy Breslin and and Pete Hamill. You know, uh, just storytellers. Um, you know, and, and that's what sold papers um, in the fifties. Um, a, a well-told yarn told sold papers. Um, you know, people people learned. You know, people learned how to read with American journalism. That's what the comics used to be all about. You know, you could actually, you know, if you're a Polish immigrant, you know, if, if you were if you were an immigrant from Hungary from Russia, that's how you learned the English language by reading the comics. You know. Um, you know, by looking at the newspaper, uh, it was your introduction to American education. Um, that no longer exists. Um, most of my students really are interested in, not in storytelling. Uh, they're really interested in, in, in what's called euphemistically strategic communication, which is working for a politician, working for a, an institution, working for a sports team, and strategically communicating with a demographic, you know, and, and, you know, they know exactly how many eyeballs they're getting at any given moment at, at the day or night. They know exactly how effective their messaging is. They don't really do news. They, they sell content, you know, they're content providers, you know, um, so the, the world has changed. There's still a place for storytellers. There's still a place for, Hardcore political junkies uh, who want to go into the into reporting uh, about graft and corruption and influence, um, but it, it's changing right now. It's an exciting time, I think, to be a journalist because there's there's a shakeout period, 
and, and people now who are getting into journalism who can tell stories well, um, I, I think there's a real market for their skills. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, okay. So the economic financial model is maybe broken, but, um, you do have to, you have to raise money. You got to pay those journalists. <laughs> They're not going to do it for free. And you got to pay the electric bill for your office where everybody works and on and on and on. How do you do that without, you know, having a for-profit company? I guess you could have it as a nonprofit, but you don't want a state TV, state newspaper, because then you end up with Pravda or North Korea, China kind of syndrome, if you will. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what the alternative would be. It's a conundrum. You know, when Obama um, bailed out banks, I, I kept on thinking to myself, why is he bailing out newspapers? You know, there used to be afternoon newspapers. You know, there used to be a lot of newspapers. There are 40% fewer newspapers today than there were 30 years ago. You know, and, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Cities have now one newspaper. Without competition, you, you, have, you have no um, interest to tell the truth. You have no interest to get to the story first. Um, so I, I thought, you know, why isn't there a newspaper relief bill? Well, of course, you can't have a newspaper relief bill because it would be sponsored by the government. You know, but, you know, NPR is in part sponsored by the government. Um, and, and I think it does a, an interesting provocative job. Um, so I, the news model is broken. You know, no one reads their news in, in black and white now anyway. It's not on newsprint. It's, it's all with a device. Um, if you're going to tell a story, you've got to tell it visually. You have to tell it through a podcast. You have to tell it through action. You have to tell it through video. Um, you know, and, and I think that's, I think long form journalism will, will work if it's not print based alone, if it is in different formats, if it's through podcasting. You know, one good thing about commute, the commute, the long commute, is that people can't stand to be alone. So they need to have stick something in their ears, just like you're doing, right? So you need to have a storyteller. You need to you need to have someone tell a story with a great beginning, middle, and end. That's really satisfying. That's why we see all these crazy crime stories on TV. You know, that's why there's um, um, you know all of these like you know crime podcasts. Um, but that's mm -hmm. why Malcolm Gladwell is really interesting. He does these great podcasts. That's yes, sort of, he's a great storyteller. Yeah. So I I think you know uh, newsprint is is no more. I had a friend of mine uh, say to me, well, uh, I, I don't like to read Kindle. I like just to read books. Like, I like the feeling of books, you know, hardcore books of pages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's like what Moses. I like that. <laughs> yeah, but that's like Moses saying, I like a tablet. <laughs> yeah, I like the Ten like Commandments. <laughs> um, you know, that's like <laughs> yesterday, dude. It's sort of like, you know, mm -hmm. like these stone tablets had to go, you know, and, and yeah, I like news. Uh, I like newspapers also, but, you know, it, I don't like now newsprint coming off on my fingertips. So I'm reading papers online and, you know, gradually I, I'm, I'm gravitating to, uh, you know, to reading online stories too. You know, newspapers sort of fill up, you know, my basement and, you know, they're bad for the, uh, environment and you know i got to do something with them at the end of the month and uh, you know they're just much <laughs> more efficient if you can just press a button and also it's better for uh, for the news because newspapers have to be printed have to be trucked and have to be thrown by like a nine-year-old and it has to hit my front door or if it doesn't <laughs> i have to run outside and in the cold iowa winters and grab it it's much better just to press a button and to get my news on my ipad and also, if the news changes, uh, I, it's updated automatically. I don't have to have updated. another edition. So time, it just makes yeah. sense for newspapers yeah. to, um, to understand that the model has changed. It's also cheaper. You don't have to pay to, to, to cut down trees. You don't have to pay for news. Uh, That's right. Ink. Yes, yes we've, we've hit peak stuff. Think about yeah. the album and, and, uh, and cassette tape and, and all those that we, and DVDs. You don't have to have any of that anymore, right? Okay, so on the evenings, I toggle between CBS, NBC, and ABC evening news at 
they all seem to cover the same stories in the same order. Assuming they're not all talking to each other in the morning going, what are you going to cover? We're going to cover, you know, Biden's trip and then the Ukraine and then the school shooting and then the heat wave. But they all seem to do that just by default. Why is that? It's top down journalism. It's what the government says is news. It, it's the, the press release that comes out from the White House. We need to cover. We need to cover the president. Um, it's all top down. What I'm more interested, and the way journalism is going to um, survive and indeed flourish, is bottom up. I'm more interested in the butcher, the baker, the barista, the the bartender. I don't really care about the banker. I don't really care about the politician. I'm I'm more interested in in every man. I'm more interested in 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 how the guy is going to send both his kids to college, pay his rent, uh, also buy a buy a car, buy a truck, and also um, make sure he doesn't get, get cancer because the, the, um, there's asbestos that's leaking out of his uh, assembly plant. You know, so that's, you know, you want to get at why, at how journalism is going to flourish. It's not top down. You're absolutely right. The, you know, the 10 agenda setting media organizations all follow the same format. I don't really care about what what Biden did, I don't really care about um, you know uh, about what my mayor did. I'm much more interested in this bottom up stuff, just generating stuff by listening to people who are you know Tom, Joe, Harry, Bill in my neighborhood, and really listening to their stories of woe, their stories also of of of, of exaltation, their stories of excitement. Their stories of of satisfaction. That's the way I think journalism can get back. It's not it's not um, necessarily positive stories, but it's stories that are from the heart. It's Charles Corral stories, by the way, for those readers who are old enough to remember him. It, it's oh, stories yeah. that <laughs> yeah. are about America, um, and I think that's the way to get back on track. I am really tired of you're right seeing the same stories done, you know over and over and over, you know, that's what has caused, you know, this rift of, of right-wing readers deciding that the New York Times is, is spewing lies and really replaying and replaying and replaying, you know, Biden falling off a bike, you know, just loving those stories. <laughs> um, you know, who cares about that stuff? I, I, I really want to learn right. about the average guy out there, um, and 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 how he's trying to make meaning of his life. Uh, I, I think there's an opportunity that journalism ought to seize, and in, in many places is trying to do that. One of the problems is that journalists are based in places like L.A. and New York and Chicago, and they don't really have a clue of what's happening, you know, in flyover country. They don't have a clue, you know. You know, you get all these journalists come to Iowa for the Iowa caucus. You know, the, the, the state of Iowa probably earns 50 to 100 million dollars, you know, with this Iowa caucus. It means nothing. And at the end of the Iowa caucuses, journalists leave, you know, and they and they, you know, but Iowa isn't representative of anything. It's not representative of America. <laughs> uh, but but the reason that we get this agenda setting big city journalism is that's where the newspaper media centers are. Um, and, you know, they might, the New York Times has one uh, correspondent in Chicago whose job is to cover, you know, the nine state Midwest area. That person can't do it because when there's a plane crash, that person's got to you know, get to O'Hare. Um, so you, you've got to reimagine the media landscape out there to begin to think of covering America as it is today. Hmm. I wonder if a subscription-based system in which you just have hundreds of blogs and podcasts covering exactly what you just said, and people just pay 10 bucks a month or five bucks a month to, to read that, if that would replace the old uh, financial models that, uh, that are broken. I don't think that's going to work. I, and, I, and I think it's too bad. But, um, you know, The Guardian asks me every month to chip in, and I don't. You know, they said you've mm -hmm. read 10 articles, mm -hmm. chip in. Um, right. You right. know, NPR, I listen right. to NPR 
and we're spoiled. We can get it for free. So why would we pay for subscriptions? Um, you know, uh, I mean, there's a reason from the New York Times point of view to give out free content because, the, you know, you're getting eyeballs. The advertisers like that. But, um, but I, I don't think people, people are spoiled. I don't think people are going to, uh, to, to ante up to, to get editorial content. The only kind of editorial the content they want is editorial content that agrees with them. Ergo Fox. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Also, I, uh, I, I do subscribe to quite a few. I try to do my share and support starting to add up. You know, I have the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the L.A. Times, the Washington Post, Hulu, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime Video. Let me see. I got NBC Peacock because I want to watch the Tour de France on my uh, phone. And, you know, there's probably a dozen more. I'm several podcasts that I financially support. And all of a sudden, you know, the bill comes in, my credit card bill at the end of the month. I'm like, wow, this is kind of, it's hundreds of dollars a month that I'm spending on this. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if it was all like this, it'd probably be a thousand it a is. month. You're absolutely right. Um, a lot of young people don't don't have cable. Why get cable? You know, what they do is they, they right, cherry pick right. what they need. So they cherry pick Hulu. They cherry pick Netflix. They cherry pick Big Ten football. You know, um, you know, one of the nice things about newspapers used to be that, and used to be, that someone else decides the template. You know, there are eight stories that are, that, that skilled journalists say are the most important pieces that you ought to read. You know, that's what NBC, that's what MSNBC, to its liberal core, tries to do. These are the important stories. That's what Rachel Maddow tries to do. These are the important stories. But... The reality is that there are a lot of other stories that that don't that get filtered out, that never get that never get to Rachel Maddow, that never get to Fox News, that never get anywhere. Um, and we're missing those kinds of stories. So we're you know, what we're doing is we're cherry picking the stories that we like. You know, we're cherry picking the stories that agree with with our political sensibilities. And as I said, I think we're too spoiled to pay um, for for anything other than news that we agree with. All right, Stephen, we've just breached the two hour mark. Yeah, no, we just, <laughs> so I will be mindful of your time now. And, 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 and thank you for your, your, your book. I loved it. I read it very carefully, of course, as you know, cause I, uh, excerpted it, which you'll can read in the next issue, but get the book. And, uh, and, and I look forward to whatever you're going to write next. Thanks, Michael. Nice meeting you. Nice talking to you. <laughs> um, I love, I love Likewise. skeptic and I love what you're doing. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Take care.